This video is brought to you by Architect Network and our online platform of courses where you can learn from world-class architects working in some of the practices that you can see in these videos. You can learn Grasshopper, Revit, Rhino Inside, Twin Motion, and some of our new courses on AI and lots more courses that we're we'll delivering over the next year. So please, if you like this video, check out our courses in the link below so we can keep bringing you more content like this. What's up guys and welcome back to another video here on the Architect Network. Today, we've got our first feature of the Architect Tours. Now the Architect Tours, the idea of them is to show you guys a little bit behind the scenes of some of prominent firms here in London and beyond, hopefully, so stay tuned for that. And we're also gonna talk to some of the tech people so you see the tech guys behind some of the products that you see online and ask them what kind of software they're using, how does design technology work in each practice. Today, we're gonna to be here with my own firm, Big, here in London, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how design technology plays a role inside of Big. So right now, it's minus two, so let's get inside, because we're freezing. All right, welcome to Big London. This is our office. Uh, so the London office has been here since 2016. We started with only a handful of people. We grew to about 30, 40 people for a bunch of years. Now we're here today. We are around 130 people here in the London office. That's one thing people don't realize how big, uh, big London has grown over the years. Uh, and we'll come and give you a bit of a tour now. So this is our canteen space. This is essentially where we hang out, we do, Friday bars, so we let off a bit of steam. We do presentations, so we'll do talks here or just chill out and have lunch. But it's kind of like our, our communal space where we hang out. Here, I'll talk you through some of the models and some of the products that we have in the office right now. So actually, I'll talk you through a little bit of like some of the products that started the London office. So this office started because of the Google products that we designed and built in collaboration with Heatherwick, which I'll show you in a little bit. But this was also a key product uh, that kind of kick-started the growth in London. This is the ETB tower in Berlin. It's almost, uh, it's topped out. It looks like a built uh, project right now. This is uh, the next big product that we had here in London. It was the Daily Express building. It's 120 Fleet Street. It's currently a big hole in the ground uh, under construction. So uh, this building here was the Daily Express building. It's a grade two listed building. So this one we are refurbishing. So yeah, maybe one other cool thing about this building, obviously each terrace, you've got these stepping terrace. So each floor pretty much has their own private terrace. And the really cool thing about this is from the terrace, you have pretty epic views of London as a whole, but also you got St. Paul's, you got the cluster of of the London Towers there. So um, this is one thing that we've seen like post COVID, we're now getting more and more office buildings that have breakout outdoor spaces. Before it was always a challenge to convince and we were always convincing developers to add terraces and now in a post COVID world, uh, it's being requested. So uh, yeah, this should be a pretty cool feature of this building. Moving on from that building, another key project that really kind of continued the growth of the London office is the City Life building in Milan. This is a competition that we won. This is a building that kind of sits in the middle of Milan and this is essentially an office building. The roof is completely covered in photovoltaics, so the building can generate a lot of its own energy from the roof and you can look into the story of the design a little bit, but the roof kind of frames these other buildings next to it rather than competes with them in terms of verticality. For sure, one of my favorite features in the office is our little 3D printed projects. So every single one of these projects is printed at the same scale. The nice thing about this is you can kind of get a sense of scale. You, you somewhat get lost sometimes in the comparison between one and the other. So uh, this is our little fleet steep project here in London. So you can see next to the Coco Towers in Miami, they're pretty similar scale. The one that always blows me away, you've got obviously Via Tower, uh, Vancouver House, which are all fairly well-known projects. Obviously our, our Copenhill project. But the one that always blows me away is the Spiral in New York. Um, 
when you put it next to one of the other other buildings, it's uh, it's huge. It is a whole city block in New York, so it's pretty big. But I think it's always super cool to see these side by side and get a sense of scale. So yeah, actually, some of the products here, these are actually designed by Big. These are part of our collaboration with Artemidi. These are kind of bubble lights, um, which are pretty cool. Sometimes we get these as gifts for uh, Christmas. Uh, these chairs we've also designed. These are, this is our VIA chair, inspired by our VIA project in New York. These are our brick sofa, super comfortable and uh, really playful. And so yeah, the table is actually, uh, I think the facade from the mountain house, which was of course, one of the iconic projects that kind of kickstarted the big era and the yes is more era. So now let's go and have a look at some of the workspace and some other parts of the office. So these are some of the products that we currently have in the office here in London. We've got our uh, London tower that I was just explaining, 120 Fleet Street. We've got the tower that is built in uh, Frankfurt, Germany. ETB office tower in Berlin. Yeah, this is our Google campus. It's designed outside in the New York office uh, in collaboration with Heatherwick, which is now being built, it moved in, and the Googlers are Googling away. So this is where the magic happens. This is actually the office. We have a mix of the project design teams. We've got ops teams, the DT teams, all mixed in with different people here. This is definitely a cool feature. We've got little windows into the other offices are big. We've got Barcelona, uh, obviously here in London, New York. It's about five in the morning there, so there's no one there right now. Uh, but it's kind of cool. You can see some of my old colleagues from New York sometimes passing by the office and you can give them a wave. Here we have our wall of fame, all the different posters and front covers of magazines that have featured big. It's always kind of cool, I think, for sure, being featured on Wine Magazine. As a DT guy, that's definitely one of our coolest uh, front covers. But yeah, there's a whole bunch of different ones here. So this is our ESET campus in Slovakia, near Bratislava. This is a cybersecurity company slash office. This is like an office campus. Um, the cool thing about this is obviously the roof is a key feature in this. It kind of emulates the mountains that set like here, which you can't quite see in this model. The roof is completely covered in solar panels. So it's completely, it's almost uh, generate all the electricity that the campus needs through the roof itself. This was one of the first products that uh, I did when I came here in London that we did in BIM. Obviously from a BIM perspective, it's kind of a, on somewhat a simple product in like uh, the buildings are not too crazy in terms of the geometry. But the roof of course is, was a bit more of a challenge in terms of Revit and placing solar panels. So this is typical, like we're always kind of having to solve uh, these are issues in Revit where some of it is pretty standard in, in Revit and some of it we have to get a little bit creative in how we model these things. This is obviously the project that kicked off the London office. This is our Google headquarters here in London, in King's Cross. Again, we designed in collaboration with Heatherwick Studio, which is currently under construction. It's a massive project. It's almost like a ground scraper. It looks like it's just built out of three stories, but actually in each story, the uh, floor plate inside offsets a little bit. So you can see your colleagues on the floors below. It also allows natural daylight to penetrate right into the center of the building. Pretty cool building that I think is finishing construction this year in 2024. All right, so come take a look. This is my secret DT underground layer, AKA the VR room. The teams can come down here and just explore the designs on screen and also on the computer. We can bring clients down here and all that kind of stuff. We have our high specs VR computer down here. So this is where the guys can come down, you know, with their big Enscape models, twin motion, could be Unreal, whatever it is that they're experimenting with. Typically, it's usually Enscape. It's fast and it's easy to just have a look through things in VR. Uh, in terms of headsets, we got a whole bunch of headsets. We've got the trusty Vive for our kind of day-to-day -day VR stuff. Uh, we've also got a Meta Pro. 
uh, that we kind of use again with Enscape, Twin Motion, and other things. Sometimes it's more custom Unity applications. We also have Amad in New York, which hopefully one day you'll meet, that's making some cool stuff with that. And then over the years, we've also been experimenting with the HoloLens. This is the HoloLens 2. So this is augmented reality. The nice thing about this, you got virtual reality, augmented reality, and this guy kind of does both, which is uh, super nice. But uh, we were definitely experimenting with this uh, on site. Like, so now you can just walk around the construction site with your like uh, stylish sunglasses, you know. You could just be cruising around the shore ditch in this and no one would care. Um, but obviously with this, we're trying to connect more with the act of making and the construction process and overlay BIM models or 3D models, for example, whilst we're building the headquarters. But, and the cool thing is you can flip these up and, you know, now they're cool. Welcome to our workshops. So this is where we kind of make some models, we got 3D printers, and uh, we can build some of our own in-house models. One thing that's been super interesting with the workshop uh, since I joined in 2018, I think we had like one or two 3D printer in the workshop, and we were still in that era of like the blue foam where you're cut, wire cutting it out, which if you've ever done that is a pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and suddenly the whole, workshop transformed with 3D printers and now our workshops have you know walls of ulti makers and other printers. I'm in here with uh, Helena who's one of our workshop specialists and Peter over there who's uh, the workshop manager and uh, as you can see here we are daily <laughs> you know refurbishing these, refining these, you know they're great machines uh, but occasionally you do need to fix them. <laughs> Maintain them mostly, Maintain make sure them, yeah. that, yeah. So, uh, Helena, give us a little bit of a walkthrough of like the different kinds of printers that we have here. We've obviously got the altar makers of different sizes that are all going. Exactly, the difference between these two is just the newer technology and the bigger build size, like the build plates, the volume. Um, the bigger ones are obviously our favorites, but we're still trying to revive Keep those that going. give us a bit of a hard time. But overall, it's a, it's a reliable technology, I think. And we've grown, you said you had one when you first joined. There's nine. Yeah, like now. one or two, and now we've got yeah. global warfare. Exactly. I think one, one thing I see the teams using it is like, it's study models, right? It's sometimes it's full on production models. Mm. Um, we're also, course. you know, we're also trying to get people um, a bit more comfortable to use them and not have it be this like, Yeah. Fear of like, so what if I print something? And yeah. Exactly, and like, not only come in here to make a final model, but also like a concept or study yeah. or something. It can look nice because <laughs> it's pretty printed. Yeah. But this is basically our plastic wall, um, and over there we have another technology for three D printing. Go and have a look at these things. This one I'm going to call our favorite because it's the one that failed the least. Uh, so shout out to <laughs> Form Labs. <laughs> yeah. Form Labs. This is an example of something that we print. It's obviously a much smaller build plate than the others and also much smaller than this one here, but it's way more reliable in terms of successful prints and like not breaking down, like maintaining it. This one is comes all the way from Hong Kong. So every time we need a part, it's like 10 days of <laughs> shipping, <laughs> waiting, stress. But these ones, you can get a lot more detail, right? It's like, like yeah, this, then about this here. These two, like the technology in general, uh, compared to the FDM, yeah. It's a bit, you can actually zoom in if you want. I can show you maybe like, this is how thin the supports can go. And then you can really see like a tiling on the roof, for example, just like a bit of texture. You can go as thin as like 1.8 uh, millimeter rods. We printed the Eiffel Tower as an example of how thin we can go on the railing. Can put the Eiffel Tower. Can we put the Eiffel Tower in here. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's supposedly it's being put in there before being sprayed, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of an OCD, whatever is happening here. This is our display model. <laughs> <laughs> this is the microwave. Don't put your food in there and just put your 3D printer. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so yeah. Late night, on. this is where we put our pizzas <laughs> to heat them back up. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, it's a small workshop, but we we have a lot coming out of it. Yeah, yeah. Especially it's when it's always nice, so. really cool, and it's always nice to have models all around the office. 
Okay guys, so now we've done a little bit of a tour of the office, we're gonna sit down and talk a little bit about design technology at BIG. This is the part where I'll be asking questions to the design technology people in each office. In this case, that's me. Uh, so I'll be answering a few questions we've prepared, as well as some of the questions uh, that you guys have submitted online. And as we go, do check out Instagram because we will be asking you guys the questions you want us to ask for other offices. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Oliver Thomas. I'm the design technology manager here in Big London and also part of the global design technology team at Big. Uh, sadly, this is actually my last week at Big, so I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of a tour before I go and talk about design technology. Stay tuned for what's coming in the future and uh, you'll hopefully see more of these videos as well. So uh, we'll jump into a few questions and get started. So what is the role of design technology at BIG and how you work on a day-to-day -day basis? So yeah, design technology at BIG is our like umbrella term for the tech that we use in the design process. So it's everything from BIM, computation, a little bit of simulation, immersive, which kind of involves visualization, AR, VR, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the fabrication side of things, so the guys in the workshop, and then also the new kid on the block, which is AI, of course. And uh, we have various different specialists. We have design technology specialists that are people that have all parts of those things, BIM and computation. And we are basically like an in-house resource where we help each project on a day-to-day -day basis with the tools and technologies they need on the project. But we're also working on like more of a global way of testing new technologies that we can add into the design process of BIG that will aid in what we do. Of course, the goal of design technology is that we're here to like support the unique design process at BIG. So uh, whether that's you know computation in the earlier stages or BIM in the later stages, for example, I would say like our bread and butter in the design technology team is BIM and computation. Obviously, computation is typically more used in the early stages, BIM in the later stages, and now we're juggling all these other things like visualization, immersive, and AI. So each office has a design technology team, and that team will, like, uh, will handle that office, but we also work globally as a team, sharing resources and the things that do and don't work in each office. So for example, BIM, we share a lot of the resources and templates and things like that. But of course, each office is customized. Computation is a little bit more global and AI and things like that. So we're working locally, but also globally at the same time. <laughs> How does design technology fit into the design process? We work in terms of helping the teams in a few different ways. So one, of course, is simply uh, we help the teams on a day-to-day -day basis. That could be as simple as someone coming to ask us to help them with a grasshopper script. It can be a bit more serious and long-term that we get assigned to projects. For example, this project is now going into stage three or stage four, and we need to produce a BIM model. So then we're assigned a bit more long-term. And so we help them on a day-to-day -day basis with whatever they need. It could be anything from a quick grasshopper script to coming up with like some kind of immersive walkthrough experience. The other big thing that we're always trying to do is to uh, amplify the designer's own technology skill set, design technology skill set. So we're also trying to train the designers in grasshopper, in BIM, and all this kind of stuff. We're very much a firm where it's not for example, the BIM side, we don't just build the models for the design teams, we train the designers with the skill set of BIM so they can build the BIM models and we aid them in that process and we'll help them particularly in the advanced workflows and things like that. So on one hand, we're here to, as a consultant, help them. On two, we want to amplify their design process. And three, is like I said, is really trying to test new things that we think will make the design process better or enhance the design process. So for example, this crazy new thing, AI came about, we quickly test it, see if we think it's useful, get it into the hands of the designers as quick as we can, and then see if it's adopted or not. And um, yeah, so it's always different ways that we're trying to integrate it into the design process and into the design teams. 
talk us through the basic software that you use at Big. Yeah, I think this is like the number one question I get asked. And it's a question we will ask other firms as well as we go with these architect tours. And the answer will almost be exactly the same. So like our design tool is revolves around Rhino. We design in Rhino, that's our space where we get creative, we iterate especially quickly, we test all the things. So Rhino is sort of like the foundation in terms of where we design. Then of course we have things that aid that, Grasshopper of course, in terms of computation and allowing us to explore more things, analyze stuff. Uh, so obviously Grasshopper is a big component in our design process. Then of course you've got the Viz side, which plugs into Rhino, which we're mostly using. Enscape is probably our main tool right now. We do of course use V-Ray for that kind of slightly high-end uh, in-house production. And I do see like a growing trend in twin motion is definitely making a comeback, shall we say, uh, particularly if we see projects with like uh, rich in nature and things like that. And then the kind of sister to Rhino is Revit, like in terms of as soon as a project evolves outside of concepts, it uh, doesn't matter if contractually we need to, we will always bring the project into Revit after concepts. And that's because, you know, that early stage is very chaotic and we're iterating. Once we go into concepts, uh, out of concepts, we go into Revit where we can start documenting the building and we can document in a much more efficient way. And then, of course, that's where Revit, we can get aided by plugins such as Rhino Inside, which act as a bridge between our Rhino world and our Revit world. And the interesting thing about that is uh, we can now use Grasshopper for that, which is a common kind of language the designers already know from the concept stage. So uh, like mo most firms, that's the broad, that's the bread and butter of you know, the software that we use. Of course, there's loads of other things that we're using. I'm not gonna name all the Grasshopper plugins that we use. Um, of course, there's also a little bit of game engines and things like that, like Unreal, Unity that we're experimenting with. And of course, we are experimenting with AI in places. Uh, of course, Midjourney is, is one of those tools, but uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's the broad spectrum, and I'm sure that same answer is gonna be for many of the other firms that we will visit. How does BIM and computation play a role in the office and in the design process? BIM is very much like where we document the building. That's where uh, once we kind of have concepts, we go and draw our plans, our elevations to that next level of detail, sheets and all this kind of stuff. So BIM is very much almost part of the uh, later stages, but anything outside of concepts. And of course, you know, deep when we go into construction. Computation uh, plays more of a role in the earlier stages stereotypically. So we may be scripting a building, scripting the facade, analyzing massing, or just simply automating what we're doing, like placing a, a thousand trees on a surface or something like that. Um, but of course, computation can continue very much into later stages. So again, it helps us, uh, we can, like amplify our BIM process with computation. Again, like just bringing geometry from Rhino into Revit, or we can use it to automate things in Revit. So uh, I would typically say like computation is stereotypically heavy in the concept stages and somewhat like less so in the later stages. And BIM is the reverse of that. Uh, we're using it less in the very early stages, but in the later stages, it becomes paramount. And it's always a balance between the two. And that's one thing why we are always looking for DT specialists that have both sides of that coin of BIM and computation. And it's still one of the things that is, it's more common to find people with those skill sets, but it's still hard to find. So that's why number one recommendation, if you're interested in becoming a specialist or getting into design technology is to have that BIM and computational side for sure. So with regards to visualization, what software are you using at the moment? It was interesting when I joined BIG in 2018, we were very much using V-Ray was our bread and butter for like day-to-day -day renders, rendering out of Rhino, 
And then we did have Viz teams that were kind of using uh, V-Ray and Rhino and 3ds Max. But then uh, Enscape got introduced into the office. By 2019, I was seeing like, let's say 10% of projects using Enscape and the rest using V-Ray. And then fast forward to, let's say 21, it was the complete opposite. Like everyone was on the Enscape train. Uh, we still use V-Ray for like, you know, that next level of render. But at the moment, Enscape is absolutely uh, bread and butter, like visualization tool. But like I said before, we're definitely seeing a, a growth in teams wanting to use twin motion because especially in those nature rich environments. And I think we're really interested and have been experimenting with Unreal as the kind of new era version of high end renders. So before it was like 3ds Max and V-Ray. Now we're kind of interested in like, will Unreal be the place where we can create high quality visualization? And of course, again, like the, the little new kid on the block is can we use AI for visualization? And so we've definitely been experimenting with LookX, Stable, uh, Midjourney to see if we can use it kind of as part of the rendering process as well. So how about immersive design, VR, AR, game engines, and the metaverse? What are you experimenting with that big? As you see, we, had like a, we have our own VR room that we're experimenting with. VR, I would say, is very much part of the design process now. The teams know they can use, you know, Enscape and Twinmotion have made it so easy. You just click a button and you're in VR. And so we can use it as like a part of the design process. Like, what does it feel like to be in this space uh, as a presentation tool, obviously, for, for clients and things like that. This has obviously been around for a while now. Um, and it's still like finding its place VR. I think people are still a little bit hesitant to put the headset on in meetings. So we also experiment with like having it on screen and walkthroughs. Um, like just giving someone a game controller actually is kind of interesting and some people are more comfortable with that kind of thing. Um, so virtual reality I think is, is ingrained, but I feel like we're waiting for the next iteration of virtual reality. Sorry, let me scratch my nose a sec. Um, <laughs> augmented reality, on the other hand, is something we, again, were experimenting with uh, and trying to find a place in the office. And um, I think it found a couple places, like one in the workshop, because augmented reality is typically more connected with the act of making. So uh, the workshop guys started to adopt it to aid them in like uh, the modeling process. Um, and then, of course, we also experimented with it on site, particularly in uh, Copenhagen, when whilst we were building the headquarters office, we could test this on our own construction site, which is pretty unique, um, and see, like, is there a way we can use this as designers coming onto the construction, uh, the construction site? Would the contractors be interested in using it in helping them in their process? And so again, it's, it's one of those ones we're experimenting with and it's trying to find a home within the design and the construction phases. And then finally, I think the more broad term of immersive world, what excites us most is things like Unreal. Uh, we have been experimenting with Unity a fair bit. Ahmad in New York has been building some custom workflows to uh, you know, take clients through more curated workflows in VR. Um, but I think we're really excited about Unreal at the moment in the future. We've started to experiment building our own headquarters in Unreal. And I think whilst everyone is so excited about AI and the FOMO of AI right now, I really think Unreal has a lot, so much potential that maybe we're not seeing at the moment. So I think that's definitely an area that we're super interested to continue to experiment with, not only as a Viz tool, but also like virtual reality, augmented reality, animations, online experiences, maybe even getting into the, the gaming world. Um, I think Unreal gives us so much potential to experiment beyond the walls of architecture. So for sure, I think Unreal is a big thing we're interested in pursuing in the future. 
and, and like the metaverse as a term, I think we've experimented in the metaverse. There's a few products that we've, we've done, some collaborations. Uh, we did a project with Vice, for example. Again, I think it's still in an era where we're still understanding what the metaverse is, what it's going to be. We've definitely done some experiments, some products we have publicly and also some private ones. Uh, again, it's something we're really interested in keeping an eye on as we work out what exactly the metaverse is going to be and what we're going to use it for. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to experiment with it. But that's, again, why we're really interested in, like, Unreal gives us the opportunity, like, we can, like, build a product in Unreal and we can use it for, you know, viz process, in-house processes. But then if something does come in the world of the game world or the metaverse world or digital twins, nine times out of 10, it revolves around Unreal. So I think that's what's interesting about Unreal is once you do have it in there, uh, there's so much opportunity to do things with it. And I think that's what's, uh, what's really interesting. But as for the metaverse, we're still kind of keeping an eye on what the metaverse is going to become and what opportunities it presents us as architects. So how is AI being used in the office and what are you using it on in projects? Yeah, so this is like the million dollar question right now. Uh, of course, AI has definitely come into the office. You know, Mid Journey has now been in the office for over a year at this point now. Um, I think generally we're, we're, we're experimenting and keeping up with all the things that are going on within AI and seeing, again, how we can integrate it into our design process. I think one thing is clear, like everything that we use uh, DT4, it's about amplifying our unique design process and uh, how does it aid the thinking behind the project. I think the thing right now is uh, we see like all these images, people can create images so easily now and create ideas so easily, but actually the thinking behind them uh, I'm actually seeing the opposite. It's like there's less maybe thought behind the image. And so what we want to do is like, uh, I think one of the unique things at Big is the thinking behind the pro project and the image or the render that you see at the end of it is the kind of final product of that. So I think we're experimenting with one, again, getting into the designer's hands as quickly as possible. We've seen them use it in many different ways. It could be like, inspiration for the beginning of a project. It could be like as a way to illustrate a mood or materiality or an idea, not necessarily like a, a specific solution. It could be as simple as almost like a presence that we can create in terms of like an idea or a mood or something like that. I think one of the ways we've really seen it be potentially successful is we've managed to integrate it with uh, design tools like Rhino. So we were experimenting with uh, sending screenshots from Rhino to Stable and like painting on top of the image with Diffusion uh, or using maybe LookX AI or some of the other tools. Um, and so, yeah, we're definitely experimenting with, with how we can use like the creative side right now of AI the diffusion side. And then, of course, it's like maybe the, the less sexy side, the what I call like the production side, which is it could be as simple as like when people start to use ChatGPT to help you, I don't know, rewrite an email or something as simple as that. But now we're starting to see it is we can, we can especially in the DT team, help us to like, I don't know, uh, rewrite code, check for errors, even get designers to like, can you check um, various building regs, things against it? Like, not that we can trust AI at that point, but uh, it could be as boring as like maybe Kobe requirements in BIM and making sure the codes are correct. Like, so we're also trying to experiment and find ways like, where can we use these other tools like large language models in the production side to help us with some of the bo more boring stuff. And I think that's also like a bit of an underrated opportunity. Like as always with a lot of the DT stuff, like can we free up the designer's time in production? Like whether it's uh, rewriting an email or drawing a wall line by line in CAD, 
uh, if we can free up the designer's production time, the designer's production time, we can give them more time in the thinking process, and that's where we add the most value. So again, coming back to this AI thing, I think we're 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 looking at it from that angle as like how can it aid us in what we do and the thinking that we have, rather than like we obviously want to avoid the the era where you know, people are just using mid-journey to come up with the idea and we're just then solving it from there. Of course, that's exactly what we want to avoid. Um, so yeah, AI is a crazy one right now. We're experimenting with it, we're testing it, but at the same time, we're kind of seeing where it fits within the design process. Um, so yeah, we have some questions online that we're gonna, I'm just gonna quick fire, answer a little bit and uh, we'll roll into it. One thing that we were going to answer that someone asked is, what is the next big revolution in AEC you look forward to in 2024? I think for me, there's two things I really see that are exciting. Generally, that is AI, of course, for sure. I think 2024 is going to be a super interesting year. We're going to see uh, real-time diffusion. I think we're going to start to see that being integrated with Rhino and parametric workflows. I think that's super exciting. Um, so AI in general, of course, uh, and then Unreal. I think, like I said, Unreal is super exciting. I think everyone is foaming over AI right now, but actually there's some incredible stuff going on in Unreal and game engines. So for me, the two things I'm excited about this year is uh, AI and Unreal. That's the two things I'm gonna be upskilling this year for sure. Um, there's a, another good question. What's something special about Big? that you don't find in other offices. Um, I think one thing that is special in BIG, I mean, I haven't worked in all the, all the other offices, uh, so I can't really say exactly what it's like to work in them, but I do think the environment of BIG is uh, something very special. That's what I think the, the like secret source, so to speak, of being a BIG is. Everyone's super friendly. It's a super creative environment. Uh, you're also encouraged to share ideas and workflows and stuff with other people. Um, so I do think the culture inside Big is something that is really special. And of course, this comes from the top, from Bjarke, and also some really key people uh, over the years, like Kai Uwe in New York is a big component to the culture in Big and many other partners. Uh, so I do think that's one thing that's particularly special about Big. They celebrate when you join, they celebrate when you leave, you keep in touch. Uh, so yeah, once you're a bigster, you're a, you're a bigster for life. <laughs> um, there's another question of what experience should one have to join a design technology team? This is a great question because uh, like we were looking to add someone a few months ago. Uh, we joined, we had Hannah join us. Um, and one thing I do think if you want to join a design technology team, like I said, having that BIM and computational skill set. If you want to be a design technology specialist, that's someone who broadly has everything. You're not just BIM, you're not just computation. Uh, to have that BIM and computational skill set, uh, of course, you do want to have some experience as an architect. I think that is a good thing to be, you know, you were a designer and now you've become a specialist and it's been like a natural progression. Um, I do think that's a, that's a good thing. Obviously, you have to have a pretty good grasp and advanced knowledge of BIM or and computation or computation and simulation and AI. You need to have like a superpower in one of them maybe, but also be interested in the other ones. And of course that last part, you have to have an interest for technology and architecture, I think. Um, so yeah, for, th for those, we're always looking for a few things. Obviously the technological skill set. Uh, you have experience as an architect, as a designer, you have a, a bit of experience in terms of this more specialist side, and most importantly, uh, having uh, an interesting personality to join the team and fit into the culture here at BIG. Um, another question, at which level do you use Unreal? Do you create live presentations, video game style? Uh, this is one we're definitely experimenting with. It's not so much utilized on projects as much as we like right now. Um, I do, again, this is why I'm kind of really interested in Unreal. I do see a huge presentation aspect where we've kind of evolved from like slides and diagrams, right, to 
diagrams and GIFs to GIFs and videos. And now we're kind of in the area of videos and, and like immersive experiences. So I do like, you put video game style, I do actually think that's a good thing. Like I'm actually finding more people are used to having a controller in their hands than they are having a big headset on their head. So uh, we're not using as much as we'd like right now, but again, it's for sure a big part of that. Um, how are the tech guys, computational designers implemented on in projects? So again, I touched on this a little bit, but the, the specialists are assigned to projects more long term when depending on how uh, if it's like a BIM process or a long computational process, I don't know, you're generating an entire master plan, they'll be on the project more long term, but it can also be short term, like, hey, can you help me with this script today? And you sit down at a desk for 10 minutes, you could be helping them for uh, two hours. Uh, so yeah, it's super, um, it can completely fluctuate. Uh, another question from Nathaniel in, uh, in-house training and onboarding. Do we do in-house training? This is a little bit of a plug, but yeah, we do have in-house training, particularly for design assistants. We do like a mini boot camp. So for example, some of the guys will take them through not how to learn Rhino, but like the uh, how we use Rhino and some tips and tricks. I usually teach them Grasshopper, for example, uh, a little bit of BIM, that's more project specific. So we do have, uh, in-house training for like new recruits, uh, the design assistants. And then in terms of like in-house training generally, I am always trying to host like Grasshopper workshops, Rhino Inside workshops. Revit workshops are typically more project-based. So if a, like this team is going into Revit next week, we do like a Revit training. And so, yeah, I've been doing a lot of the in-house training. Of course, this is where Architect Network was kind of born. A lot of these courses I was building here inside of BIG, and now I've reformatted them, and that is what the courses are now available on our website. So that was the whole point of Architect Network, was to uh, teach from the perspective of practice. So the foundation course that we have on Architect Network right now is exactly the same thing. I teach the Bigsters in-house here at BIG. There's one other question. If you could share anything with yourself before starting this career, what would it be? <laughs> a lot of architects would probably say, don't get into architecture. <laughs> um, I don't know, actually. I, uh, I think one career thing that helps me massively, um, and maybe this also answers the question of like how to get into the design technology team, um, Going to, to a conf going to conferences is actually hugely beneficial. I know it's sometimes it can be expensive. As a student, it's sometimes a little bit more affordable. But my whole career, actually, you can kind of follow it back in terms of getting into design technology and computation and all these things to going to um, Smart Geometry in 2014 in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, from that, I joined my last company, Front and got into the computational side of fabrication and facades. And actually, uh, how I got into BIG was also through people I met at that conference. So by far, uh, going to a conference was the most influential thing I did in my career, for me. Um, I also think that like, uh, if you've applied to a lot of, if you've applied to BIG before and you didn't get in, I think I had applied to BIG uh, three or four times before I actually got an interview and, and go in. So, you know, it's always about timing with opportunities in, you know, firms like BIG. If you don't get in the first time, it doesn't mean you're not right. It's just mean maybe the opportunity wasn't right at that time. You're still developing a skill set. And, you know, sometimes uh, we hire for projects, projects come in and we hire and then products come in later and we hire again. So uh, yeah, if you've applied to firms that you really want to get into and you, you, know, you didn't get a reply yet, don't be down about it. Definitely try again because uh, you know, things always change. So timing is always a huge thing in terms of progressing your career, for sure. All right, guys, thanks for coming and joining us on the tour here and hearing a bit about design technology at BIG. As I said, this is going to be the first architect tour that we're doing. 
We are gonna be visiting some of the other offices here in London and eventually beyond that, so stay tuned for that. If you do like these videos, give us a like and a subscribe so we can keep producing them. But otherwise, thank you and we'll see you in the next tour.